Hello, uh, welcome to this presentation on advanced modeling techniques for efficient crop irrigation. This is a work that was mostly done by Antoine Richard and Lior Ferry within the context of a joint project between France and Israel. I am Cédric Pradalier. Just to get started with the basic principle of irrigation, here is what happens in terms of water consumption in the normal life of a crop. Initially, one assumes that there are water reserves in the soil, on the left. When the plants are growing, they are consuming water, and this leads to evaporation, either from the soil itself or from the plant. This results in a depletion of the soil water content, as you can see here on the right. The principle of irrigation is to bring in water in a quantity which is equivalent to what was lost by evapotranspiration so that the water reserves stay the same across the duration of the season. To achieve this goal, one needs to estimate evapotranspiration. This is typically done with an eddy covariance tower. An eddy covariance tower brings together different sensors that includes, in particular, a heat flux sensor, which is an expensive and sensitive device. Once we can estimate the evapotranspiration, it is possible to produce a recommendation for irrigation. So in summary, what we are trying to achieve here is to estimate evapotranspiration using only some meteorological variable. In practice, our output would be latent heat flux, which is equivalent to the evapotranspiration. This outcome will be used in two scenarios. The first one is gap filling, where we have a data sequence where the latent heat flux is missing for a few days. This is depicted here on the left with a blue line highlighting the times where the flux couldn't be estimated. Our goal is to use the weather data with a train network to produce the orange curve on the right and fill the gap. The second scenario will be to predict the water needed by a field and to create recommendation for water irrigation. Again, it is important to remember th that we want to achieve this task without using the eddy covariance tower. So let's have a look at the methodology we will be using. Our goal is to use a neural network that is inspired from the field of natural language processing. The latest technologies in natural language processing are working on the prediction of word sequences so as to understand the meaning of a sentence. In comparison, in our case, we have a sequence of data and we want to fill in the gaps, which is similar. We have access to the data history and we can learn the specific dynamics of this data. From this knowledge, we want to identify what is happening inside these gaps. In practice, we start with networks with high generalization capability, and we build an architecture that does not rely on either the day of the year, on the crop development, or even on the time since germination. One challenge is that we intend to train this network with a limited amount of data before and after the gaps. So let's have a look at the data we are working with in practice. The first five variables describe the weather condition, the time of the day, or temp the temperature, the wind speed, humidity, net radiation, so basically the solar radiation. From these five variables, we want to predict the latent heat or the evapotranspiration. These data are collected in three crops, tomato, cotton, and wheat, on six sites across Israel. In case where we miss a couple of data points on the weather channels, we can also use data from the nearest weather station. How do we generate the dataset for training on the neural network? Our goal is to show that our method works everywhere on any field at any time. But because we are quite limited in terms of the amount of data, we have to hand over to be efficient with the way we manage this data. We create one dataset per site by splitting it into a test and validation set. All the other sites are then used as training set. For each data set, we create three training configuration by considering three categories of gap generated artificially. Large gaps cover three to six days, medium gaps 1.5 to three days, and small gaps 0.5 to 1.5 days. Finally, to maximize the representativity of the data, we make sure to dis distribute the training sequences over the complete growth season. 
I will now give you a bit more detail on the architecture of the network we designed for this task. Our inputs include the time, the observation sequences, which is mostly the weather condition, and the target evapotranspiration sequences, with the gaps. Additionally, we provide a mask input to identify where the gap is located. This mask is important because it allows training the network to predict the gap without having to learn to copy the data from the input sequence. All the data streams flow through some linear embedding, which is then combined with positional encoding that expresses the time of the day in a form usable by the network. The three attention heads are used to focus the attention of the network on either the observation sequence, the target evapotranspiration, or a combined representation. The produced output is evaluated with two metrics. The root mean square error evaluates the quality of the prediction, as typically done in machine learning. Alternatively, the mean bias error directly quantifies if there has been an excess or a lack of water in smart irrigation studies. These predictions are completed for every gap that we filled and for every dataset. For each step, we create 100 synthetic gaps and we repeat the experiment three times. This leads to results evaluated over 300 gaps prediction. For comparison, we evaluate our results against the prediction realized by RADProc, which is a standard software used to process data from eddy covariance towers. In average, our approach is doing quite well on the RMSE. We are 11% better than RADProc in average. In terms of MBE, both approaches are equivalent because they are both not significantly different from zero. If we look at the minimum and maximum RMSE, our approach was worse than RADProc only once out of 18 experiments. But because there was a high level of uncertainty on this particular experiment for both approaches, the difference was not really statistically significant. In order to provide a practical example, here is a sequence of, that was predicted out of a six-day gap. The prediction can be seen in blue, the ground, ground truth in green, and the output of RADProc in orange. It can be observed that even though the difference is not very large, our prediction stays closer to the ground truth, in particular around evapotranspiration peaks. After showing the performance of our neural network on the gap filling problem, we will now focus our attention on the experimental evaluation of the network in real irrigation tests. To this end, we prepared an experiment on the north of Israel, in the Hula Valley, the site of the south is called Gadot. This is where we actually collected the data for the eddy covariance prediction and the network training. We used the data from the weather station at Kabul and we conducted the actual irrigation experiment at Gadash on the north. In this case, there is 16 kilometers between the two sites. This is interesting because it shows that the prediction we are learning is not extremely local. It has a domain of validity that applies around the area where the data was collected. But as long as the climate is similar, it should be possible to use the same model to predict evapotranspiration. Okay, in this picture, you can see the tomato field with the eddy covariance story that would be used for reference. Now, if we look at the evolution of our parameters over a season, the green curves tells us what the network is predicting in terms of evapotranspiration. Next to it, in blue, we have the eddy covariance tower evapotranspiration. We can see some differences that I will describe in a few minutes. For reference, in yellow you can see what the FAO56 recommendation would be for the same period. This recommendation is a table used by the grower to set the irrigation based on various plants and weather parameters. If we look at the difference in details, we have two big differences which are actually due to the rain. When it rains, the assumptions that we use for the evapotranspiration prediction are no longer valid. So the network prediction differs from the actual evapotranspiration measured by the tower. At the end of the season, the FIO56 recommendation is much lower than both the prediction and the measurement. This is actually because it is recommended to actually reduce the irrigation at the end of the season to increase the sugar content in the crop. If we look at the RMSC error compared to the eddy covariance measurement, our network prediction of the water need is in average closer than what the FIO56 recommends. We also developed a web interface to predict the water requirements on a daily basis. The choice of the web interface was to simplify the use in the field and to help predict the water requirements. 
For a practical evaluation, we prepared a comparative experiment where we applied different irrigation patterns to different parts of a tomato field. The first one is a control, which in this case is actually a water recommendation by an expert who has full access to the plant and ground condition, including two electrodes in the soil to measure the avail available water. Then we also applied 50% irrigation, 75% irrigation and 150% irrigation to observe a spectrum of what irrigation could be around the control. The plot labeled 5 is irrigated following the irrigation recommendation from the neural network. Plot label 6 has been used for another experiment that is not relevant here. When we look at the yield, that is how much tomato is produced at a given crop, we see that there are, there are a few plots that are completely complete outlier. This can be explained by the fact that we have a prevailing wind that will dry the exposed plot. In a normal field, the plants are typically protected by the other rows unless they are on the edge of the field. As a result, these specific plots have been removed from the analysis. Based on the experimental setup, we now look at the cumulative irrigation, which is the amount of water added across the season to the field. In blue, one can see the control, that is, what is the expert with expensive sensors with all the data decided to add to the field. In red, 50%, brown 75%, and 150% in dark blue. This gives you an idea of how the effect of these different strategies for the cumulative irrigation. In green, we can see what the network predicted. We can see that there is an offset in comparison to the blue curve. This is mostly due to an error on the first day where the practitioner did not follow the network recommendation. If we compensate for that, this produces the dashed green lines, and we are nearly exactly on the control. For reference, the yellow line is what the water recommendation would be from the FAO 56. If we now look at the yield in red, we can observe that our neural network achieved a yield which is nearly equivalent to the control. This is extremely interesting because this shows that without using any complicated sensor, just relying on simple weather data, we could achieve the same yield and approximately the same irrigation as well. In practice, with equipment that is available to any grower, we can achieve the same performance as what can be achieved with high-end equipment. There is no loss of productivity and just the appropriate amount of irrigation. In conclusion, in this presentation, we showed that we are able to train a neural network capable, capable, capable to predict the latent heat flux or evapotranspiration for durations of up to six days, based only on web data. In the context of gap feeding and in comparison with RID procs, the train network tends to be able to, to manage noise data around the gap. The or originality of our architecture is that it can be adapted to any regression task that shares this type of time cyclicity. If we now look at the experiments, we show that our neural network based prediction is on par with what an expert can do with expensive sensors. And what is even more interesting is that our network only requires access to very simple weather station data to achieve the same performance than the, than the expert in terms of irrigation and without loss of productivity. To finish, I would like to give our thanks to Lionel Clavien from InnoBoost for giving us access to the very powerful service that helped us train the networks used here. Also, we would like to give our thanks to the Ministry of Science and Technology in Israel and the Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation in France, who supported us under the French-Israel Maimonide programme.